Welcome to the Infection Prevention and Control Training video. This video has been created here at Mid and South Essex Hospital. And we'll take you through a number of topics in relation to infection prevention and control. After this 15 minute video, you will have gained your compliance for this topic. And this will be shown in next month's Statman report. As the name suggests, infection control is about preventing and controlling infection. Good infection control practice is built around the key principles of using standard precaution. And these principles are hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, safety and sharps, equipment decontamination, safe handling and disposal of clinical waste and laundry, and water safety hygiene. This video will identify how we use these preventions to control infection. The question to start us off is if controlling infection is achievable, how does infection spread in the first place? Well, it takes a series of events that have to happen to enable germs to cause infections in a person. We call this the chain of infection. The chain of infection consists of six stages. The infectious agent, the reservoir, the portal of exit, the mode of transmission, the portal of entry, and the susceptible host. It starts with the infectious agent. This is simply the germ that causes the infection. The second link is the reservoir, and this is where the germs can live and multiply. It can be the infected person, or it can be the surrounding environment. The third link is the portal of exit. This is the means by which the germ can escape from the reservoir. The fourth link is the mode of transmission, and this is when germs are on the move. It can happen by hands touching dirty equipment, or through the air by coughs and sneezes. Moving on to the fifth link the portal of entry. This means that the germs now invade the next person, known as the host. This happens by entering wounds and cuts, or being swallowed. It can be inhaled if it's airborne. The last link is the susceptible host. Most healthy people can fight off this stage, but people with low immunity will be vulnerable to developing infections, and therefore the cycle begins again. To break the cycle, we need to think of each part of the process as a link in the chain. If we break the link, we can stop infection arising. Whilst talking about the links in the infection chain, did you know that all patients that have an invasive device, such as a cannula or a catheter, must have an invasive device tool? Care and attention to insert and maintain invasive devices reduces the risk of infection. After all, patients with devices are at greater risk of infection because these procedures provide an entry point for the germs to enter the body. The Health and Social Care Act of 2008 states that the Trust has a legal duty to protect patients, staff and visitors who may be at risk from acquiring a healthcare-associated infection. In England, over 6% of hospital patients still acquire some form of infection during their stay. Healthcare-acquired infections, also known as HCAIs, are defined as those that develop 48 hours following admission into hospital. Every day, HCAIs result in prolonged hospital stays, long-term disability, massive additional costs for the health systems, and in some circumstances, unnecessary death. The most common HCAIs are urinary tract infections and infections at the site of surgical wounds. Two keenly targeted HCAIs are MRSA and C. diff. MRSA is costing us around £3,000 per patient, and C. diff, well, that costs us around £4,000 a patient. Let's talk about MRSA. The Department of Health has issued guidance for managing patients with MRSA and on improving infection control procedures. This includes aiming to prevent vulnerable patients from acquiring MRSA, trying to prevent MRSA from becoming endemic in the hospital environment, and ensuring that patients with MRSA colonisations or infections receive optimal care. MRSA stands for Metacillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. MRSA is a particular type of Staphylococcus aureus that has become resistant to many commonly used antibiotics. It's not really a threat to a healthy person because it usually only causes infection in someone with a weakened defence. So let's talk about screening. You see, early recognition that a patient is colonised or infected with MRSA means that effective control measures can be implemented and the appropriate antibiotics given. Our screening swabs take place in the nose, throat, groin or CSU if the patient's catheterised. All emergency patients must be screened on admission. This excludes children unless they're in a high-risk group. All elective patients are screened for MRSA prior to surgery. At Basildon, all elective patients are screened, while at Southend and Mid-Essex, screenings are based on risk assessment. If a patient has a positive screen result, then an alert will be applied to the patient's medical notes. In this situation, the patient should be isolated with visible isolation notices on the door. 
Standard precautions should be implemented and an alert will be added to the electronic patient record by a member of the Infection Prevention and Control Team. All MRSA patients, both newly identified or previously known, will be placed on an MRSA regime and that means that they'll have their own integrated care pathway. So what do you need to remember when caring for patients with MRSA? Prevention of transmission is key. You must ensure that you decontaminate your hands and apply standard precautions. Patients in high risk areas should be isolated into a single room and we should be using the appropriate antibiotic therapy and decolonization treatment to reduce the infection risk. It's about ensuring that we don't compromise the medical care. So it's essential that the patient's status is communicated to the patient as well as all other healthcare providers as appropriate. I mentioned decolonization treatment and this consists of an Eptenison body wash daily and a nasal Bactroban oil. We then need to wait 48 hours after the decolonization before rescreening. Patients colonized or infected with MRSA can undergo investigations in any department providing that that department has been informed in advance. Staff within the department must practice standard infection control precautions and all equipment used must be decontaminated before reuse. Services are to be decontaminated using trust approved disinfectant wipes before the next patient is seen. Commodes must be decontaminated using a trust approved sporicidal agent. The patient doesn't require to be placed at the end of any scheduled lists. Did you know that short-term exposure to other patients in clinics or departments is not generally a problem unless the MRSA patient has exposed skin sites? In these situations, the clinic or department should arrange for the patient to be seen straight away on entry to avoid waiting areas with other patients. Let's move on to C. diff. C. diff stands for Clostridium difficile, which are anaerobic bacteria. This means that they don't need oxygen to survive and multiply, and as such, they can live in the colon where there's very little oxygen. C. difficile doesn't usually affect healthy children and adults, as the bacteria normally present in a healthy bowel keeps it under control. It's important to remember, however, that some antibiotics can interfere with this healthy balance of bacteria. When you have a C. difficile infection, bacteria can multiply and produce toxins that cause illness. Once the C. difficile bacteria start to produce the toxins, the bacteria can spread easily and the spores leave the body in an affected person's diarrhea. Once out of the body, the spores are resistant to conditions and can contaminate toilets, commodes and other equipment. So what are we doing here in the trust to keep on top of C. diff? As recommended by the Department of Health, the trust uses a two-part testing process to identify Clostridium difficile carriage, and this includes testing for GDH. If the first test is negative, it means that C. difficile is not present in the gut at the time of testing. If the GDH test is positive, then the sample will be tested for the presence of the C. difficile toxin. To prevent C. difficile spreading, it's important to physically separate the symptomatic patient from other vulnerable patients by isolating them immediately and obtaining a stool sample. Prevent C. diff spreading by washing hands with soap and water for both confirmed and suspected cases. All symptomatic patients and patients that present with unexplained diarrhoea must be isolated in a single room. We must obtain a stool specimen and they should be commenced on the Bristol stool chart. Now I've mentioned a lot about isolation. I should point out that there are two main types of isolation, protective and standard. Protective isolation is the physical separation of patients who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed and this is to prevent them from becoming infected from others. Then we've got the standard isolation. This is also known as source isolation and this is the physical separation of one patient from other patients to prevent the spread of infection across the ward. This isolation can be discontinued if the infected patient has had a normal stall for three days. At BTUH, the standard isolation, including respiratory precautions, must be adhered to when a patient is suspected or confirmed to have airborne or droplet infection. Appropriate PPE, including masks, either surgical or FFP3, isolation and strict hand hygiene is essential when caring for such patients. These standards include, but are not limited to, tuberculosis, measles, meningococcal, meningitis and pertussis. Well that covers our HCAI section and we do of course know that not all HCAIs can be prevented. However, it is estimated that around 15 to 30% could be avoided and that's through consistent prevention practices and essential activities such as hand washing. 
Now, before we learn about hand washing, we do need to be aware of the infection risks that can come from contaminated water. Both Legionnaire's disease and Pontiac fever are caused by an individual breathing in small droplets of water that have been contaminated with Legionella bacteria. So what's Legionella? Well, it's a bacteria that's usually found in natural sources of water. It's only when they make their way into the artificial water supply system that they become more of a concern. Large buildings, such as hospitals, are more vulnerable to the contamination due to a larger, more complex water supply system. This means the bacteria can spread quickly. In terms of your personal actions, you need to report any unused or little-used water outlets to estates and facilities. Also, if you're temporarily closing an area with water outlets, estates and facilities will need to know about this too, as the water flow is integral to Legionella control. OK, now we can go on to hand washing. The five moments of hand hygiene to follow. Before patient contact. When approaching your patient, use a hand rub on clean skin. This is to protect the patient against harmful microorganisms carried on your hands. Before aseptic task. Wash hands at the start of an aseptic procedure and use hand rub during the procedure if required. This will protect the patient against harmful microorganisms from entering the patient's body after body fluid exposure risk. As there could be invisible contamination, it is advisable to wash hands with soap and water. Clean your hands immediately after an exposure to body fluids to protect yourself and the healthcare environment from infection. After patient contact. It's important to use a hand rub or wash hands with soap and water when leaving the patient environment or following removal of gloves. Be sure to clean your hands after touching a patient and the immediate surroundings when leaving the patient's side. After contact with patient surroundings, remember the environment as well as equipment and surfaces can be contaminated with various microorganisms. This can be harmful to patients, therefore it's important to ensure you decontaminate your hands. Did you know that hand hygiene is the simplest but most effective way to prevent spread of infection? Hands must be decontaminated immediately before each and every episode of direct patient or client contact and of course after any activity or contact that could potentially result in hands becoming contaminated. We all know how important it is to wash our hands and the routine of scrubbing up by surgeons before an operation, well, that's of course a well-established practice, but this was not always the case. Until the late 1800s, surgeons didn't wash their hands between patients and that caused infections to be transferred from one patient to another. Igne Semmelweis was a Hungarian physician whose work demonstrated that hand washing could drastically reduce the number of women dying from infections after childbirth. Semmelweis introduced rigorous hand washing rules on his maternity ward. This resulted in drastically reducing the death rate in his hospital. So let's see how his discovery lives on today with our six stages hand washing technique. Hand washing should take between 15 and 30 seconds. First, we need to rub palm to palm. Then rub the backs of both of your hands before rubbing your palms again. This time you're interlacing your fingers. Rub the backs of your interlaced fingers, don't forget to wash your thumbs, and then finish by rubbing both palms with your fingertips. It's quite common for hands not to be washed properly. What do you think the percentage of people who miss some part of their hands when washing is? It's a shocking 89%, so keep that in mind the next time you're washing your hands. Moving on to the basic rules of routine hand hygiene. Before washing our hands, we must remove all jewellery and wristwatches as microorganisms can collect underneath these and in the parts. However, if you've got a smooth band type for your wedding ring, that should be fine. It's important to keep your fingernails clean and trimmed and make sure that you pay special attention to your nails when you're washing your hands. Whilst we're talking about fingernails, don't wear nail varnish or false nails to work as they harbour microorganisms and they could become detached during the day. Now finally, and quite importantly, you must make sure that you wash hands before preparing food. So what else do you need to know? Well, before we move on, I need you to be aware of the bare below the elbows policy. This means that you should be free from clothes and jewellery below your elbow joint when you're working with patients or in a patient's area. In addition to good hand hygiene, what else helps to prevent infection? Well, it's not a huge surprise that the answer is personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. 
Protective clothing can provide a physical barrier to infection and personal protective clothing includes gloves, aprons, face protection and respiratory protection. Let's see how we can get the best from them. Gloves must be worn where exposure to blood and bodily fluid is anticipated. When using gloves, you must wash your hands before wearing them and after removing them. Gloves must be changed and disposed of after each procedure for each patient. Moving on to aprons. Aprons should be worn to protect the wearer and their clothing if direct contact of bodily fluid is anticipated. What about goggles? Goggles must be worn for any procedure in which there's a high risk of splashing bodily fluids into your eyes. And finally, respiratory protection such as special masks should be worn for transmissible respiratory infections. Whilst PPE will protect us as much as possible, we do need to be aware that accidents and infections can occur. For example, needle stick or sharps injuries are a risk that we need to be aware of. Needle stick injuries are the penetration of the skin from a needle or another sharp object, which prior to exposure was in contact with blood, tissue or other body fluid. If this happens to you, you must squeeze it, bleed it, wash it, cover it and report it. You will also need to attend occupational health during office hours or if it's after 5pm, you need to get down to the emergency department. There are three levels of decontamination. The first is cleaning, which is the physical removal of soiling. The second is disinfection. This is eliminating most microorganisms on inanimate objects. The third is sterilization, and this is completely killing or destroying all forms of viable microorganisms. Before we take on the full decontamination area, I really need to mention single-use items. A single-use notification on a package of any medical device will indicate that the manufacturer intends for this item to be used once and then disregarded. Single-use items may have insufficient evidence to confirm that reuse would be safe or they're considered not suitable for use on more than one occasion. Single-use items leads us nicely into contaminated waste. All contaminated waste must be disposed of in clinical waste bags. At South End and Mid-Essex, we've got the black bags for domestic waste, the orange bags for clinical waste and the yellow containers are for sharps waste and of course this helps reduce the risk of needle stick injuries. Now let's look at Basildon. Use the yellow bags for anatomical waste, the orange bags for clinical and infectious waste, the clear bags for domestic or recyclable waste and for offensive waste use the yellow and black striped bags. Any dry or clean cardboard packaging must be flat for storage. Small cardboard items can be placed in the green bags. Large items should be flattened and stored separately in dirty utility rooms. Sharps waste must be disposed of in the yellow boxes with the appropriate colour lid. Cytotoxic and cytostatic sharp bins have purple lids. Hazardous sharps bins have yellow lids and general infectious sharps bins have an orange lid. In regards to linen, we must use the appropriate linen waste bags. We've got the pink lined bags for the infected linen and the white plastic bags for used linen. Decontamination includes a whole host of resources. Let's look at them now. Wipes are used for decontamination and cleaning of equipment. Clean labels are to be placed on all clean equipment that is stored. The sprays are for cleaning and decontamination of commodes and the spillage kits are for spills of bodily fluid. So what else could you be using them for? We should use wipes to clean mattresses after each patient discharge. A mattress integrity check must be completed and the bed is made ready for the next patient. Ensure all required documentation has been completed. Don't forget that disinfectant wipes are also essential for cleaning equipment like stethoscopes. This video is almost complete and I know there's a lot to take in. So don't be afraid to revisit the video. You can also continue to be curious about infection prevention and control by visiting the infection control policy section. Thanks for watching. And if you've got any further questions, please do contact the Infection Prevention and Control team.